This video presents the perspectives and reflections of six individuals who have made significant contributions to the field of survey research over the past 50 years. Here they discuss issues facing field operations, both then and now. Jean Converse, former director of the Detroit Area Study, an ongoing survey project designed to train students in survey methods, and author of several books on survey research, describes the roots and emergence of the field of survey research. Well, I'm going to lead this, this off uh, by sketching in a little bit about the beginnings and the boomings of survey research in the United States. Uh, polls and surveys really go back a long ways. Um, I think of William the Conqueror arriving to invade England in 1066, and within 20 years he had he sent out his field staff to uh, all the properties in the country, the better to tax them, of course. Um, but I'm not going to stop in the 11th century. I'm going to fast forward up to about the 1930s, because that's um, an era of the Great Depression, and also the era in which the Gallup poll became a household word. Um, and those are the two, those represent really the two beginning points of survey research in my view. Uh, surveys did not start in the university. The academic social scientists who were interested in, in real world data, facts and attitudes, uh, could at best conduct a few qualitative, long, intensive interviews with individuals or they could circulate questionnaires with their captive audiences in their college classrooms. But this was small-scale work. And large-scale surveys, especially national surveys, were really out of reach for academics. And all the field directors know that it certainly took a big organization in the beginning. Uh, well, it still does, but in the beginning it required uh, for face-to-face -face interviewing, hundreds of interviewers scattered across the country. But just to consider the hundreds of interviewers, it would have been a very amazing university department that could consider the care and feeding of an army like that. In the 30s, academic departments were very small affairs. It would be a handful of professors. I'd like to say a little bit about the two realms in which money could be raised to conduct large-scale surveys. First, government fact-finding. This really, well, this was an old practice also, um, but it, it burgeoned especially toward the end of the 19th century when in conditions of industrialism, of 19th century industrialism, made uh, urban poverty very visible and very grim. So there was concern in government and concern in reform movements outside government, trying to influence government, to get the facts. In fact, it was during this era that a poverty line was developed for the first time. But the social surveys of this early period, late 19th and end of the 20th, uh, were not systematized and they were not of national scope. So. You could do censuses, but you really could not gather sample data. So it was in the 20th century, in the 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression, that we discovered, in particular the United States, that we didn't have the facts. The crisis was obvious. Unemployment was, was massive. Everyone knew that. Hungry, hungry families, literally, who were on the road. Uh, there were state governments being besieged for relief aid far more than they could deliver. And yet, we didn't really know the size of the crisis. And it's out of this desperate need for information that government statisticians developed a practical means of area probability sampling. And thus, we could begin the process of government statistics that are now uh, you know, just every place. In this process, the early social survey became the sample survey because being able to, to take 
a scientific sample was the linchpin of what became survey research. George Gallup uh, became the most famous of the new posters of the 1930s who did put together a national sample. Now, this was not a genuine probability sampling. It was pretty rough and ready and rather frail, but it was serviceable enough, serviceable enough for the moment. And it was a, a way ahead of having just draw votes. In the 1936 election, uh, Gallup, who was a brilliant publicist, uh, threw down the gauntlet very publicly to the leading straw vote organization, which had been predicting a landed victory, and told them that FDR would win. Well, as we know, FDR did win, and Gallup won too. So he had gone into polling from a, a, a very interesting background. First, he had a PhD in applied psychology. He had academic appointments in universities in journalism, and he had a prominent career in advertising and market research. And he obviously had boldness and real flair for this polling operation. His, his organization has always sounded like the public interest or even an academic nonprofit, uh, the American Institute of Public Opinion in the town of Princeton. But in fact, it's a business and always has been. And it was, it made, it's, it supported itself by syndicating polls in, in syndicated columns in leading newspapers. Uh, but care, uh, Gallup was careful to be nonpartisan and his polls covered uh, a, lot, a lot of topics which were of interest to readers. So it wasn't just the coverage of the horse race, although that, that validated the polls. If they could predict the election, that was uh, evidence that they were truth-telling in other areas. Uh, he ultimately uh, became a spokesman on the world stage for the democratic importance and potential of the science of public opinion, the science of public opinion, um, or public opinion polling. Uh, academics later scoffed at this pretension, but at the time, it was an interesting and important development, and he was certainly doing it better than other people, though it was a superficial operation. But the second big magnet was World War II. When, uh, by the time of Pearl Harbor in 1941, uh, the power of the Gallup poll had become very apparent to certain government administrators, and they were very interested in, in this device, the national sample especially. Social scientists streamed into Washington, glad to make a contribution to the war effort in a non-combat role, and some of them joined the new survey organizations that were set up within the government. There were seven or eight, as I recall, small, but their mandate was to gather facts and attitudes especially about both the military, the soldiers, and uh, soldiers and sailors, um, and the, the, the public on the home front. Uh, <coughs> there, was, there were many, many questions that uh, needed answering about the military. The same kind of concern about morale was apparent in surveys made on the home front. Citizens were interviewed about buying more war bonds in order to keep the lid on inflation. Were they willing to do that? Did they see the need for rationing of food and gasoline? Did they understand price control? Were they cooperating with it? How were things going on in the war plants? What about race relations? What, what were people's hopes for the post-war world? There were myriad questions like this. And Social scientists got a crack, along with posters and government people, got a crack at trying to answer questions like this in a survey context. Congressmen had, in fact, been very suspicious of polls and surveys from the beginning. And in 1944, they even uh, hauled George Gallup up for investigation before a congressional committee. By the end of the war, 
Congress had managed to whittle down or entirely dismantle the, sur the government survey organizations. So some of the social scientists who had found the wartime survey work rewarding and exciting made new careers in academic survey organizations. It did gradually dawn on Congress that they could use polls too. And this, of course, began the proliferation of polls in every imaginable political context. That really took off in 1960 in the Kennedy campaign. Uh, and it's been with us ever since, for good or ill. The, the contributions uh, of academics in the university organizations was formidable, really. Uh, they made strides in probability sampling. They trained and supervised interviewers, and polls had done almost none of that. Uh, they'd done it in trifling amounts, if at all. They lengthened the survey, the, the interview experience, from, say, 10 or 15 minutes to 40, 50, or even longer. And they pushed the edges of content way beyond anything that the polls had been able to consider even. The academics developed research designs and techniques of data analysis of great complexity and power, and sought generalizations of scientific interest. And in time, they took all of these techniques into computerization. But the Featured speakers can tell you much more about the developments of this sort as they review their own careers and reflect on the field. Uh, I graduated, did my undergraduate work at the University of New Hampshire. And, uh, and in 1938, went to Ohio State to graduate school where I was majoring in clinical psychology, uh, doing my work with the very famous therapist Carl Rogers and uh, I had worked with Carl to uh, about 1942 and in 1942 of course the World War II we got into it and uh, you really had to get out of school at that time so at this point I was looking around for uh, a job to get out of school and uh, rents is liquored the famous liquor at scale, Rensis, uh, ran a survey organization in the Department of Agriculture. And a lot of us had been in that, uh, a lot of them, not me <laughs> at that time, a lot of people had been in that organization. And it expanded in size greatly when uh, the war started because the uh, group was doing surveys for all kinds of war agencies, housing, pub uh, health, uh, everything else under the sun. and. There was an interviewing staff for that center, but uh, it was nowhere near large enough to do the work that was required. And Rensis wondered where he could get someone who uh, would know something about interviewing to train the interviewers. And he knew about Carl Rogers, and he went to Carl and asked him if he would be willing to adapt some of his techniques to the attitude surveys uh, in Department of Agriculture. And Carl said he would. And in true academic fashion, he said, I'll get two graduate students to do it. <laughs> so I was one of those two. And the other was uh, Vic Ramey, who uh, was shortly thereafter the chairman of the psych department at the University of Colorado. And we generated a series of techniques that we thought would work for uh, field interviewing in uh, surveys uh, and tried them out by getting some of the staff uh, from the Department of Agriculture in to do these. And then we set up a training program. It was about uh, a week length for uh, about 15 people each time, and we ran it for four periods. And uh, it, was <laughs> it was fearful and wonderful because it was very fast and very <laughs> intensive. I joined Rensis. He, he said, well, this has gone great. Why don't you come and work for us and continue the training and uh, supervision of the interviewers? So in I think it was July 42, I went to Washington and uh, started the work. And 
before Long was director of that field operation, and uh, worked there until 1946, uh, at which time I came to the University of Michigan to help set up the Survey Research Center. Uh, so you see, I had no idea of going into survey research at all till I got to, uh, and didn't know anything about it, till I got to agriculture and there's a quick learn. <laughs> but that went on until uh, 1946, uh, when I came up here to uh, the University of Michigan with f four, there were five of us who came up at that time, to establish the center. And the first thing we had to do was to, uh, to get a field operation. And that was 1946 that we started uh, training it. And we started our first survey when we were in, still in Washington. And uh, in the middle of the survey, it was a survey of consumer finances for the uh, Federal Reserve Board. Uh, and when we came here, I ran the field operation for a while. Uh, and then Maury Axelrod, and I'm not exactly sure when it was that Maury joined us, but uh, he took over almost all the work in uh, developing the field and was the field director while I uh, started doing some methodological research. And then he was followed by John Scott, uh, who also carried on the field operation for quite a while and had a tragic death in 1980, I think it was, something like that. It's very sad business. Anyway, that's the history of how I got in. So never any having intended to, I've been in survey research all my life, <laughs> 50 years now. <laughs> During the Depression, uh, uh, many of us took every civil service exam offered for which we could qualify. I think my career in a lot crime lab with the FBI was aborted when the fingerprint classifier list was used to fill the many coding positions uh, that were available, that had become available with the 1940 decennial census. And from lowly coder, I worked my way up to lowly assistant section chief and then was drafted. This was all before Pearl Harbor. I spent the next five years in the military and returned to the Census Bureau after the war, uh, still as a coder. After a few months of coding foreign trade statistics, uh, I decided uh, that uh, I was not satisfied to end my career as a coder, so I took a leave of absence uh, to return to uh, resume my education and increase my uh, value to the Census Bureau. And I continued to extend my uh, leave of absence for five or so years until the Bureau became impatient and insisted that I should return or terminate. In the meantime, I was completing an undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan. The timing was propitious. The Survey Research Center was making University of Michigan its new home, and I immediately applied for employment. I, and on the basis of my census uh, experience, was hired as a coder and was able to leave my job as a clothing salesman at Montgomery Ward. I was working on my doctorate. We received the Ford uh, Foundation uh, uh, grant to establish the Detroit Area Study. Uh, th this was a unique enterprise and it provided a training laboratory, a training facility in which all sociology uh, major, uh, sociology master students were required to participate. The objective was to provide uh, training on a real project, a serious project, a large-scale survey, uh, and to get hands-on experience in all phases of research design, data collection, coding, analysis, uh, and each student uh, would produce a report, the equivalent of uh, um, a research paper presented at professional meetings. Uh, all of this was done under the direction of faculty principal investigators, and the Detroit Area Study uh, was associated with the Survey Research Center at the time and was able to avail itself of all of the uh, technical and methodological resources of the center. Uh, Ron Friedman uh, was the principal in establishing the Detroit Area Study and was the first director, and I was associate director to him. Uh, and uh, I completed my doctoral dissertation using Detroit Area Study data. 
Well, I guess go back to uh, in college. I was originally a math major and then took sociology as a double major. And by the time I finished college, I was committed to sociology, although not necessarily survey research. And then I went to, uh, 52, I went to Columbia University and uh, in sociology with a minor in math stat. And at Columbia, you, you couldn't be in sociology without being in survey research. Paul Lazarsfeld was there, Herb Hyman, Marty Lipset, Jim Coleman was a fellow student. Uh, we were trained in surveys and stat and uh, if you wanted a job, the only place you could really work was at the Bureau of Applied Social Research in one of its parts. So I came up after a year in fellowship. I, I, I started as a counter sorter operator in the machine room. I interviewed in the Lower East Side in Jersey City. I was a coder for six months. I did factor analysis uh, on Friedens before there were computers and then sort of worked my way up to project director for Bureau of Applied Social Research. Yeah, well, I was I was working on my dissertation and a full-time project director in the Bureau of Applied Social Research, and uh, they were planning to hire somebody else from Columbia to go teach undergraduate methods and social methods, a stat, at uh, Berkeley, and he couldn't go due to his wife's illness. So at the last minute, they invited me, if I wanted to do that, come in as a lecturer. And a lot of the people I'd known <coughs> at the Bureau had already migrated to Berkeley, Charlie Glock, uh, uh, Hannon Selvin, Marty Lipset, and so I decided, gee, this is an opportunity. Berkeley was one of the leading departments of sociology, so I accepted and, and went off. And uh, first year is full time research, but after that, they, I got involved in the newly developed Berkeley Survey Research Center, and by the end of the second year, I was sort of committed to that. Eventually, stopped teaching before, uh, and went full time research. Well, I mean, the issue of how anyone gets into survey research, I, my story is probably as, uh, as unplanned uh, and full of accidents as anybody's. Um, I was an undergraduate English major at a small liberal arts school, and, um, and I dabbled around in history and psychology, and, and I guess the only theme I could think of was I was sort of trying to figure out how things worked. Um, I was interested in feeling, finding out how the world worked, I guess, as much as anything. And so when I got done, um, somehow as I looked at the options, I decided maybe psychology was a little more empirical about the way the world worked than English was. And uh, somehow the University of Michigan took me uh, for reasons that are not unclear. I didn't even take the psychology GREs because I didn't know any psychology. But <laughs> um, And I just really lucked into an incredible environment that I didn't know I was getting into. Um, I did not know that there was a wonderful social psychology program here that was a joint sociology psychology program that Ted Newcomb had put together and that had superstars of social science at the time. Uh, Dan Katz and Bob Kahn and uh, Ed Swanson and Cartwright and Zander and all the group dynamics people. And it was just an astounding group of folks. and. Um, so I got into that, and I say without even knowing it was here when I applied, and that just fit me intellectually so well because, because their whole orientation was trying to figure out how you address a problem and figure out what's going on, and you weren't committed to a particular discipline. The whole idea was psychologists are helpful for some problems, and sociologists are helpful for some problems, and sometimes you need that and some other stuff in order to figure it out. And, and, and that's the way the whole program worked. And, and that was really real comfortable for me. So that was a huge break, because I didn't plan that. It just happened. And then the second big surprise was um, that I didn't plan. Um, I did take the Detroit Area Study course my first year here. And that's a practicum that they run here at Michigan that um, where you get to help make up questions, and you got to go pre-test them, and then you got to go knock on people's doors and try to get them to, be, to talk to you, and got to code data, and then you got to write a report. And I liked that a whole lot. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it all. But probably the most important thing about it was it enabled me to get a job with Charlie Cannell. Um, because before I'd done that, I'd 
didn't know enough about anything that I could have been hired to do anything. And uh, after I went through the trade area study, at least I could pass. And, um, and so I started working as a research assistant my second year here with Charlie Cannell on a just unbelievable series of studies that, uh, that essentially was the launching how I got to become a methodologist. I, I was working as a, uh, I guess assistant study director was the term then, uh, which was what the term for graduate assistant. And I was, I worked at the Survey Research Center uh, with Charlie on a, a series of studies related to the health interview survey from 1961 to 1965. Um, meanwhile, I was getting a PhD in social psychology. Um, in that, that was the field office. Charlie was located in, in the field operation. And in that time, what they, they, it was all personal interviewing. Um, and um, so Charlie was I f maybe called the field director or something. He was sort of chairman of the board at that point. And, and Maury Axelrod was uh, actually the one who ran the field operation. So I was sitting there in, in this office with Maury Axelrod right next to me and, and uh, Charlie two doors away. And all this data collection management was going on around me at this, uh, uh, while I was doing these methodological things. So I was also getting a, uh, you know, immersed in the culture of what a survey organization is about, particularly the, the data collection part. And, um, and I was also getting exposed to Maury, who, was, who also turned out to be an important player in my life. I had to decide what I was going to do um, after I graduated, obviously. And the, the, the career path that was most evident was to go be an assistant professor somewhere and, and teach social psychology to someone. And um, I certainly thought about that talked to some people about jobs like that. But Maury Axelrod, who had been uh, with the Survey Research Center for a long time, about a year before I finished up, uh, took a job in Boston. Um, the main role in Boston that he had, the main job he went to Boston to perform was to uh, run a Jewish population study. Uh, the only way to get descriptive statistics about Jewish populations was to do a survey. And, and the Jewish community there sponsored a very large one that really led to Maury setting up an organization to do this process. And when I finished up, uh, the, what Maury was doing had grown enough that um, he asked me if I'd come help him do it. And I did. And that work with, that started out as being a Jewish population survey turned into a survey research center in Boston when we finished up that work, uh, first associated with Harvard and MIT and later with UMass Boston, which is where the Sur Center for Survey Research is now. Basically, there were no survey researchers in Boston when we got there. The first advisory committee that we had uh, at Harvard and MIT was headed by Talcott Parsons, of all people. Um, that's who they trotted out to be the chairman of our committee. So I don't know if he was the most quantitative person they had, but, um, but there weren't many at Harvard who were thinking about collecting data as one of the main parts of their lives. Uh, theory was just very dominant in the Boston community. And so one of the things that made me more of a methodologist and I think turned me, um, um, changed the way I thought about methodology was the role that someone who wanted to be a survey researcher had to play in the Boston community, which I, as I say, I think was different than it might have been in Michigan with a more quantitative group of social scientists to work with. Because essentially what developed was that we had to be collaborators in team projects where we would work with people who were quite knowledgeable about something, some substantive area, and, but who needed help with every phase of, of the survey research process. They needed to know how to think about sampling. They needed to know how to think about question design. They needed to know how to think about data collection. and. Um, and, and that process, I mean, so, and my whole career has really turned out to be a, a, a set of collaborative relationships with people with di in different substantive areas, trying to help them figure out how to get the best data possible to meet their needs. And that's sort of the way I've spent my time. And, um, and that's, that had a bunch of effects on the way I think about things um, as I go along. We were working with people who who did not have strong backgrounds in survey methods. The people who hung out in survey research centers you know, thought that probability samples were a good idea. 
um, and that it wasn't a good idea to save money by not doing probability samples. Um, they had all kinds of ideas about what a good question might look like, um, some of which were pretty silly. Um, they, the notion of spending good money to uh, train and supervise interviewers uh, when you could get students to do the same thing at, for, at much cheaper, particularly if you didn't bother to train and supervise them, um, came naturally to people I had to work with. And so it became really important to me to get to the point where I had answers to those questions. And it wasn't enough to say, well, at the University of Michigan, we always train our interviewers. We had to say, well, how much training is really worthwhile? Uh, how much is, is enough? What are the characteristics of a good question and a bad question? How would you know one um, when you saw one? Do we have to say, well, I like this question and you don't, so we, you know, we can make a decision on that basis? Or can we move the process ahead uh, in a, in a, toward a more rational uh, formulation? And in fact, that influenced me a whole lot. Uh, and two of my main goals in my professional life have been developing information about standards for interviewers and how interviewers are supposed to behave and how to get them to do what they're supposed to do and how to uh, design and evaluate questions so that that's not a matter of judgment but it's a ma or opinion but is a matter uh, that we can document and that people can agree on. And, and, those are, and I think the context in which I was working and the fact that I had to justify all the time why we made the decisions we did had a big effect on, on the way I looked at those issues. A long time ago, when I became a, an unmarried mother of four children, I didn't know how I was going to support them. They were very hungry. The phone rang, I took the call, and it was a telephone interviewer. And it was a very inconvenient time, but she was so skilled, she kept me on the phone. But in return, I badgered her until she told me who she worked for. And I thought that that would be a wonderful way to support my children while I would keep the same routine I had before as a housewife. Well, that was a myth. But I was hooked. Once I applied for work, and one of the places was National Analysts, and was hired, I found I loved what I did. But I didn't do it part time, and I didn't dabble at it, as others had done. I worked seriously at it. And what's interesting is that the very first study I worked on had to do with health insurance, the, the type of policy a person had and how effective it was. And we're still studying that today. Uh, from that job, I was asked to come in to National Analysts and work as a field supervisor. And that was the beginning of a different level of involvement. Aaron Spector was a vice president of social science research there, and he asked me and his secretary if we would move with him. So after about two and a half years at National Analysts, uh, we started the Institute for Survey Research at Temple. Aaron had um, taught at Penn and had conducted some studies for Temple, and each institution had asked him if he wanted to start a survey group. He chose Temple because he felt he'd have greater autonomy, and the university was in its ascendancy. And it turned out to be a very good choice. That brought me into survey research. I was the manager of the field department. When I think back to when I started as an interviewer, it was 1961. I had no idea who else interviewed. I went to briefings and there were always females there. Sometimes the study director was male and sometimes the study director was female. So I never thought about it very much. When I went to work at National Analysts, I was hired by a male. And I only had male, only males were in the position of director of the field operations during the time I was there. But I never thought about it. What occurred to me was for those people who were very fair, and John Monroe, 
who was my second boss at National Analyst, treated everyone the same. That was fine. But I had another boss who did not. Hired new males, m new people who were male, and paid them more than females were paid. And that's the first time I even considered that it might not be a fair system. Aaron was extremely fair. He, he saw everyone as exactly the same. And you, you had every opportunity. I had every opportunity. Everyone did to rise as far as we wanted to go and could go. So I did not experience that. And certainly my current boss, the director of the institute, is, is again someone who would hire anyone as long as they merited that position. So I, I have personally not felt ever discriminated against. I've felt blessed. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that when the Institute for Survey Research was started at Temple, both the Survey Research Center at Michigan and NORC graciously allowed Aaron Spector and me, and I wasn't Ellen Spector back in those days, to come and visit and to learn from them. And they shared their methods. They let us take tours of their facilities. They were just extraordinarily generous. And I've been, always been grateful. But we learned from the best. In the early days of survey research, interviewing involved face-to-face -face interactions taking place in respondents' homes. Today, technological advancements have allowed for surveys to take place both in centralized telephone facilities as well as through computer-assisted methods. Here, our speakers discuss issues specific to the earliest days of face-to-face -face interviewing using paper questionnaires, as well as the challenges emerging from the technological advancements in contemporary data collection. Initially, in our household face-to-face -face interviewing, our uh, interviewers uh, were distributed throughout the sample points throughout uh, the country, uh, and the field supervisors uh, had to uh, travel among the PSUs, hiring and training and um, supervising uh, with um, the advent of telephone interviewing, of course, that changed uh, considerably. And now most of the staffs are uh, uh, located to the same site as the uh, survey organization. Occasionally, when a field uh, a national study has to be done, I'm not sure, but I think that NORC and Michigan uh, have combined or utilized each other's staff, and that may also involve uh, census personnel. Uh, in the earlier days, we often borrowed interviewers uh, from each other, and uh, interviewers often worked uh, for multiple organizations. It's uh, in a sense, that was good. Uh, it maintained the quality and the understanding uh, of their field responsibilities, but uh, it uh, distributed their loyalties. Remember the first, uh, the first caddy study, or the first telephone interviewing we did. Uh, we thought, well, now wait a minute. The whole dynamics of a telephone interview are clearly different from. Personal. Now, in what ways are they different, and how should the interviewers behave differently? So we did a lot of you know, half-hour experiments <laughs> to try to find out what attracted people. And we thought, well, what you do when you meet someone that you don't know, you uh, have a polite conversation for a bit. So, well, maybe we should try some of that. So uh, I remember the first one we tried. We said, well, I'm calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, called North Dakota and say, what's, what's the weather up there? What's going on? This guy said, it's cold in hell. Now what do you want? <laughs> so <laughs> we, th we thought maybe this wasn't the smart thing to do. But we did pay more attention to introducing ourselves and uh, saying what we were for and so forth. And, and it went amazingly well. We thought we were going to get more of the reluctance to be interviewed. But uh, well, as you well know, people do this easily. Well, this was one of the difficulties in supervising interviews. There, there were no such things as 
tape recorders in those days. And so we'd have an interviewer, supervisor go out with an interviewer, and we insisted that we had about 12 regional supervisors at that time, and they had to visit every county every quarter or something of that sort. And they had to go out and observe the interviewers. Well, that was pretty inefficient, pretty costly, and not very productive. So lo and behold, along came a recording machine. And we ran out and grasped that. It was a wire recorder. And so you had a spool of wire about that big, and I don't know, several miles of wire on that. And it went at very high speed through the, uh, through the machine. And it turned out fairly good uh, fidelity for the first couple of times. Uh, when we'd been here for a couple of years, there was a special session of, I guess, the American Statistical Association put on a special workshop down in Blacksburg, Virginia. And they asked if, uh, if, we'd be glad, if we'd be willing to come down and talk about uh, interviewing. So I went down with my tape recorder, with my wire recorder, and had a lot of stuff all recorded to play for the group. And we got to the point where we're going to turn on, turn it on, and the wire started spewing all over the place. Just, you know, a couple hundred yards of wire, very, very thin wire, just everywhere. There was not a darn thing you could do about it. <laughs> so, the, so there was problems with that. So when the tape recorder first came out, even though they were big, heavy machines, uh, they were a godsend to, uh, to those of it never occurred to us, I think, to uh, record these interviews on telephone and record them on tape here. Uh, but the little, the little tape recorders are good, and they are fantastically uh, uh, useful to us in our, in our research uh, and in our supervisory uh, monitoring uh, procedures. Uh, it, it saved us. From <laughs> And I think it helps to establish a quality uh, interviewing staff. The interview job has changed a lot. I mean, there, there, though there's still plenty of uh, in-person interviews done. Um, the, um, the fact that in, in, in the 60s and well into the 70s, no academic or um, government survey organization would, would start out as a primary data collection, the phone, at least for a cross-section general population sample, was, was very important. And, we use phones occasionally for re-interviews of people that we had contacted before or um, um, occasionally for certain kinds of lists where you were really sure. But, um, but the, the advent of random digit dialing, uh, the waksberg matowski contributions and the documentation that you can actually sample people without worrying about lists and, uh, I mean, just switched it all around and in terms of the quality of, of, in terms of the quality of telephone interviewing that was possible. And then, as a result, the, the, the um, um, number of surveys that were based on telephone interviews. And telephone interviews have changed things. Certainly, certainly the job of a telephone interviewer is really different from the job of an in-person interviewer. Um, an in-person interviewer had to be one, as, as I think I mentioned before, in-person interviewers were not supervised very well, in my opinion. They were a lot on their own. They also had to be very big self-starters. I mean, to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go out and knock on doors and and some of that, sometimes that's not fun. It was very hard to find people who had the sort of the self-discipline and, um, and the energy to do that well and to go to, into any kind of neighborhood to knock on any door. And you never know exactly what's behind the door. Of course, the great ones, that's, that was the excitement of being an in-person interviewer. You never know what's behind the door. Um, but there were a lot of people who didn't find that question so fascinating. Thinking back to telephone studies, it's curious because when we were at National Analyst, we had conducted a national fertility study for West Off and Ryder. It was in 1965. In 1968, they came to us and asked if we could recontact all of the Catholic women from that study. But they had no tracing information. They had never expected to do this. And I'm very goal-oriented, so I loved the tracing part of it. The rest of it was quite a challenge. The papal encyclical had just been issued, and they wanted to get the women's reaction. They did, we did it. Uh, we did it learning on the job. I had done some telephone interviewing previously, 
And I took that experience and I tried to make it apply as best I could. Back then, interviewers telephoned from their homes. So there was much less control. Um, but they did it. And we were able to complete the study. And what I did from the office was call back the refusals, because I didn't believe that anyone could refuse. I, I couldn't have that happen. So I called them back. And what I did was ask them why they refused. And I said, you don't have to be interviewed. But I must understand why you're refusing. And what was curious is that they would tell me apologetically and then say, well, all right then. So I was always prepared with a paper questionnaire. And I would do the interview. And I, it, would, it was so exciting that even though I found it hard to do, it got easier and easier because I was successful. And then other people were able to do it also. I found that that was easier than asking an interviewer to call back and convert her own refusal. When telephone uh, interviewing uh, was introduced and uh, became uh, the major mode of uh, data collection, uh, it supplanted the face-to-face -face interviewing and we uh, didn't have to have the same concerns about physical appearance or dress of the interviewer or even physical condition became less relevant. I can recall the times when uh, we had interviewers in New York who would report five-story uh, walk-ups and we didn't have to worry about that. So um, we uh, were less restricted uh, in our uh, personnel recruitment. Uh, however, questionnaires had to be adapted, particularly when CADI uh, permitted direct uh, data entry. I, I think a major distinction between the uh, telephone operation and the field household operation had to do with uh, planning callbacks and travel time and use of the hours of the day. Uh, we had to plan much more carefully on uh, when the interviewer would travel, how the interviewer would travel, whether the interviewer would travel in pairs, interviewers would travel in pairs uh, or uh, individually. Um, they had to be concerned in some instances about security, interviewing at night, interviewing in households where uh, the interviewer might be female and there was one lone male at home and the security involved there, uh, or in some instances uh, where um, uh, the female spouse might be upset and discovering uh, her husband uh, alone in the evening uh, with the interviewer. Uh, these, of course, uh, cease to be problems with uh, telephone interviewing. Then our next venture, of course, was in uh, Caddy. And I remember the first study we did on that. Uh, we hooked up a few computers, I think six or something, to a mainframe down in the basement. So here we are, six computers on a big mainframe, and uh, the response time was so long that we had two mainframes going, one for about three computers, and it took this much. <laughs> well, that was interesting, and we found then that uh, the interviewers, who were experienced interviewers, uh, if they were over 40, were terrified of those computers, and they were just uncomfortable with them. They didn't know how to... Uh, the kids, 30 and under, they oh boy, let me ask this. We had a problem there because they decided they ought to find out more about this and they started punching keys and so forth and then manipulating things, so we had to <laughs> stop that. But there was really a terrific age difference in how people react to computers and uh, what they would accept and what they didn't, including the staff had the same, uh, the same kind of issues. Well, after we got through that study by very hard work, this was on a National Science Foundation grant that we had on uh, interviewing methodology. After we got through with that uh, survey, I said to the guy, who, the computer man, well, get me a copy of the questionnaire so I can read this. What do you mean, get you a copy of the questionnaire? The questionnaire is on the tape. I said, yeah, but how are we going to? He says, gee, I don't know. That's your problem. So <laughs> it was a problem. And what we did was to hire a university photographer to come with a 35 millimeter camera, sitting in front of the television screen, uh, the computer screen, and took four or 500 pictures of screen, bound them in a book, and said, here's your questionnaire. <laughs> Each time, 
is the feeling, well, gee, I wonder how this is going. I wonder what kind of problems. And it's fun experimenting with them. And each time, you've learned a few tricks. And it's gone surprisingly well, I think. So it's introduced a whole set of new, as you well know, uh, a whole set of new techniques for uh, data collection. And uh, I, I think it's really very good. There was a project that came up you know, telephone interviewing, and we had moved at Berkeley as UCLA Server Research Center yeah, from paper and pencil to a lot of telephone interviewing. And then we got a big contract to do a study of disability in the state of California, which uh, neither Berkeley nor UCLA Server Research Center thought they could do alone. And so the idea is, well, we can cover the state and each do half, and we would set up uh, the work that way. It, at UCLA, they had already experiment, experimented with computer assisted telephone interviewing, and they proposed we use we use it. But I was put in charge of being technical director of developing the survey applications of it, from sampling through everything else. And so, I got into what proved to be the first big caddy survey in academic research. On the technology side, I think we're going to face a number of increasing problems. One is. Um, we have to worry about uh, changing technologies, and technology growth is going to continue. And we're going to be driven by changes in hardware and operating systems and, and changes new versions of software so that people who are into caddy and CAPI are going to have to continually worry about adapting to uh, the changing technological environment. And that's probably going to occupy more and more of our time in the future. Uh, and then there will be new technologies. Certainly, audio CASI is, is with us and is probably going to grow in a variety of ways. So there will be a shift again to new technologies there. And it's hard to know. Uh, well, we also have you know the growth of internet and web surveys. We'll see how far they really go. But I suspect they will turn out to be a major uh, new activity of survey data collection. We are going to have to cope with both inside of academic and government shops and as potential competitors in, in commercial shops where they may not always be done well enough to give a proper sample. Uh, we've always, in survey research, had to worry about the sort of glitzy, low-quality product produced by the commercial sector, or some parts of the commercial sector, uh, and disrup disrupting the respondents and maybe making it hard to show what good quality research is. Uh, but I think that p may continue to be an increasing problem in the future. The, and the other thing that you know is intriguing that I still don't think we fully got right, um, some of the conversational interaction people talk about it, but the notion that the interaction of an interview on a phone is different from the interaction in person, it's got to be true. Um, anyone who monitors an interview knows it's true. The interviews are shorter. There's less conversation of, of various kinds. Um, but I don't not certain, I, I don't have the generalizations that I wish I did about what the implications are for how you ought to design a, a telephone interview differently or interview experience or protocol differently from an in-person interview experience. I think people pretty much do them the same except for the practical limitations of, of people keeping all the responses in their head, etc. cetera. Um, I think we're going to learn more about that someday, but I don't, we don't know it yet. Um, so those are some of the ways that at least that interviewing has changed in the last uh, little bit. Uh, not to mention caddy. I think that caddy interviewing has done something wonderful. We have control over what the interviewers do. We can see it, we monitor, we learn from it. But it also allows the client to have access to what we're doing. They see the questionnaire in construction. They also see the results instantly. They come in through uh, electronically and they know on a daily basis so that there are, they don't have to ever be concerned about what's happening. I try, I'm very conscientious about sending reports to clients, but if that's once a week, there are six other days and they know instantly what's happening. When we started to do CAPI interviews, we found that the old timers the more experienced interviewers, but ones who were fearful of computers, either grasped it eagerly and tried to learn and keep up with the young people who had done it, who were doing it naturally, 
or they just faded away. And we lost those people. They, they couldn't keep up with the technology. And the technology, to all of us, I feel, raced. And we were all trying to keep up with it. So we had trainers who weren't as experienced. While I can tell an interviewer about interviewing skills, I don't feel qualified to do that when I'm talking about laptop use. But now we have people who can do it. But initially, we didn't. So we were all learning. I don't think that instills a great deal of confidence in the interviewers, but we did our best. Um, I think that there was concern about placing in the hands of an interviewer equipment that cost as much as it did and having it returned to us. I think it also gave the interviewer pause uh, because she too now had to walk around carrying something that made her seem vulnerable. As it is, we've had a great track record, and I think we've all eased up about that issue, which is helpful. I remember when we first looked for CAPI interviewers, or perhaps we looked first for CADI interviewers, and we asked for typing skills. Well, now typing skills would be harder to find than word processing skills. So we move ahead, and younger people are growing up with using computers, so that means nothing to those younger interviewers. And the old timers who had the best track record of getting indoors haven't been lost to us entirely, fortunately. The issues confronting field operations in the 40s and 50s are quite different from what they are now. I had mentioned uh, the uh, matters of uh, travel costs and optimizing sample, uh, uh, sample distribution. Um, and maximizing the use of time for uh, callbacks. So it wasn't simply a matter of dialing a number uh, at a later date or a later hour. Uh, it was a matter of determining what was the most effective time uh, to return, which day of the week, what time of the day, and so on. And if eight or 10 callbacks were made, uh, that was quite expensive and time consuming. Um, so the travel logistics were very important to us. Uh, we also had to provide much more extensive training and sampling procedures in the field, both the selection of the sample uh, as well as implementing the sample in the field. And I'd uh, mentioned that uh, there was sometimes concern about crime or perception of crime in large communities and large cities, but it generally was not a problem. The interviewers seemed uh, to be able and willing to go almost uh, anywhere uh, and conduct interviews effectively and successfully with a, a reasonably high response rate. Uh, apparently, uh, things have uh, changed now in our major metropolitan areas, uh, and uh, the, the telephone, in a way, uh, has solved some of those problems. Uh, we also had to be concerned about uh, onlookers in the household, uh, their effect on responses, because uh, family was often present, neighbors might be present, and the uh, interviewer uh, had to be tactful and strategic in determining uh, how to separate the members of the household from the respondent uh, and um, exclude their influence and they had to accommodate to household activities, conduct interviews uh, while uh, the respondent might be doing dishes or trying to watch television or answering the phone or in, in, in rural areas interviewing a farmer sitting on the fence rail. I'll tell you, one of the greatest threats, I think, to interviewers is um, automation and the computer assistance that has come into their lives. Um, there are two or three ways in which that, uh, I think, presents real challenges that we need to work on. Um, one of the things that, that I really do worry about is that is the way it affects training of interviewers. That what happens in, in, in my experience, and I've heard uh, others who have looked across organizations at this issue, is that um, when interviewers come in and get trained, um, the focus is greater, it becomes more and more on the computer assisted issues and teaching them how to use a computer, how to use the program, how to get through that stuff. Uh, interviewers uh, 
uh, are, are of a different character. Previously, uh, they tended to be mainly women, mainly uh, upper middle class women with um, usually often professional backgrounds. They'd previously been teachers, social workers, administrators, and uh, who, instead of working full time, preferred a part time job that's. Uh, uh, allowed them to supplement, uh, supplement family income, uh, but uh, they uh, they had a totally different appearance than uh, interviewing staff students uh, now, where they're often uh, from the college setting and they're college students uh, and um, uh, aren't uh, in the same sense that the previous interviewers were. Uh, refugees from volunteer organizations and volunteer activities. They'd often worked with political parties. Uh, they were, um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, some of the socialite uh, groups and communities. Yeah, I think really is um, from the very beginning, interviewers were uh, a big focus of, of my interest. Um, part of it had to be to do, no doubt, with being in the field office at the Survey Research Center. Um, uh, one of my favorite uh, contributions to the scientific literature in, in my whole life was um, uh, there was a, a, an experiment we did. This was back when I was working with Charlie, and um, and what happened was they were trying to we were evaluating alternative ways of collecting data about the same thing, and for each interviewer's sample, we had two strategies for asking the hospitalization questions, and half the time. The interviewer would read the questions to their respondents and ask them about hospitalizations. The other half of the time, they would not read the hospitalization questions, but they would ask all the other health questions, and they'd hand them a questionnaire and say, now, I'm going to leave this with you. I want you to think about it, fill out this self-administered questionnaire, and mail it back. So the interviewer didn't, in the second group, they didn't ask the questions at all. Um, they only um, handed them a questionnaire and then left. And one of the great, I, I was, I guess I, the other thing I should say is that you need to know that one of the changes that's happened in survey research is in um, computer technology for analysis. And uh, back there, when some, back then, when, in 1964 or three, when someone said, "I think I'd like the product know what the product moment correlation is between X and Y," um, you'd say something like, "Well, um, if the Fried and Mul or Monroe calculator will hold out, I'll have it for you by noon." Um, it was. Um, it was not a trivial step to take to, to calculate a product moment correlation on a calculator. Um, anyway, uh, I calculated the, the percentage of known hospitalizations that, that an interviewer uh, got when she asked the questions herself, and the percentage of known hospitalizations that were reported when the questionnaires were returned by mail. And lo and behold, there was a big correlation. That is, interviewers who got good reporting when they asked the questions also got good reporting when it was self-administered, and, and vice versa. So the only explanation is that somehow there was a motivational or, or cognitive or something. There was a, an effect that the interviewers were having on the respondents, which carried on into their performance over and above just the simple question and answer process. I thought that was a pretty nifty finding. Um, I ended up writing my dissertation on interviewers and interviewing. and. Um, and trying to find out the different ways that they influenced what went on. So that, that was certainly part of my interest in interviewers. Uh, the fact that Charlie had always been very interested in interviewers, and that was, he had written the book with Bob Kahn about the dynamics of interviewing. That was his, sort of his um, initial big contribution to the field. Um, and, and he had always been interested in interviewing, I think was certainly part of it too. And then when you're running a survey organization, um, you know, interviewers are, um, I mean, running a field staff, a field staff is what an interviewing, a survey organization is in, in some ways. And, um, and we had to spend a lot of, make a lot of decisions about how much training to give interviewers, what to train them, how to train them, how to supervise them, et cetera. I think the interviewers that we needed going back in time, we started the Institute in 67, and that we need now have a lot in common. One of those is dedication to purpose, and that hasn't changed. The other is an understanding of the study's goals, and that remains the same. 
I think what has changed is that we're more aware of security issues. So an interviewer thinks a lot about safety, and I think that was less so early on. I also think that women have come into their own, and they have many options for jobs. It would be rare for someone to give on an application housewife as their current occupation. They have professional lives, and they do this in addition to that. They have, um, they've been out in the world so that they're more sure of themselves, perhaps more sophisticated, better educated, and make this a choice not because this is all they can get to do, but this is what they choose to do. And the guys were turning out of manuals about that thick. It looked like a textbook in economics. And we put it through, we said to the study, you know, who do you expect is going to read this stuff? They've, the professor leave got to, got to read this. Uh, so we put it through a readership study, the, so the methodology, I can't remember what it is now, of rating. What the, so they took samples of this manual, came out advanced scientific manual, uh, scientific article level. Well, our interviewers are not scientific <laughs> art, uh, method at all. So we did, tried to convince the respondent, the uh, interviewers and the, uh, the study directors that they had to change this. And they said, well, you know, we'll try to simplify the manual. Uh, didn't do very well. So I made the point again, and on one of the, one of the manuals, one of the instructions, we put a little note in there about two-thirds of the way through. If you read this, send in a card and we'll pay you 20 bucks. Of 200 interviews, I think we got four cards back. <laughs> and it's exactly what you, they never paid no attention to that. And you couldn't blame them to. It, what it did was to make the study director feel, well, I've taken care of this. This is what I'm saying. And this is the linkage that is still to this very day gives a lot of problems. The study directors don't understand what the interviewer does or how to go present. One of the things, you know, thought about is how things have changed since 1965. And, and I think one of the things that's important to appreciate is all the interviewing in, 19, in the 1960s was in, was in person. There was no academic or government organization that did much of any interviewing on the phone. Um, and so there were these interviewers who were out there. First of all, they were trained by regional supervisors if you had a national staff. Now, we had an advantage, we thought, in, a local, in our local situation because we at least could see the interviewers in person. But Michigan interviewers were trained by regional supervisors who came in to Ann Arbor once a year uh, for a little pep talk. Um, the supervision of interviewers, um, field interviewers are a wonderful group. I'm crazy about them as people. But no one knew exactly what they were doing <laughs> out there in people's homes. I mean, they were on their own. Um, and, um, and one of the studies that Charlie and I did was, uh, was an observational study we, where we actually observed the interaction between interviewers and respondents and coded what went on. And, um, and it was real clear that interviewers just varied all over the map. And they did a lot of things that they weren't trained to do. So, so I had this foundation that it, that it was hard to get interviewers to do what you wanted them to do. Um, I also had this, this, uh, these data that made it real clear that it mattered a lot that what interviewers did, that they could affect data in palpable ways that really made estimates different and, and affected the quality of data. So then I get to a, survey, a Center for Survey Research, and people come to me and they say, how come you guys are more expensive than some of these other groups? And I say, because we're training our interviewers and we spend a lot of money supervising them. Um, at an early point, we, we insisted on tape recording samples of, of personal interviewers um, interviews because otherwise I couldn't figure out how to know what they were doing. Um, and, and I felt a great need to document that this really made a difference. And in fact, a result of that was we got a grant um, from um, actually used to be the old uh, National Center for Health Services Research, which is now the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research. Um, and we produced a fairly elaborate experiment where we randomized interviewers to four training groups from the shortest training we could conceive of responsibly sending anybody out 
uh, to a 10-day training where we were going to make super interviewers. And we also randomized them to different levels of supervision, one of which we didn't monitor at all, one of which we taped, but we only gave them feedback about response rates and costs, and one of which, which is what most interviewers got feedback about, and one of which where they got feedback about the quality of interviewing. And so there was this wild, elaborate, balanced design um, that was designed to see how much training mattered, um, the extent to which more training made better interviewers, uh, the extent to which supervision mattered, how they interacted, et cetera. And um, that, I think, there was, there was a, a not so a not dissimilar study that was done in France, or in, I think it was France, Belgium, it was in Europe, yeah. And, which was astoundingly similar uh, at the same time. Um, and it, but anyway, there was a, a, this other study that um, I, I think we had more elaborate measures of what actually happened in interviews and, and of outcome measures. But in any case, um, the, the study had several key findings that I think were really important. One, it really showed that, un, that interviewers who weren't, very, weren't trained um, weren't very good. And we could really document that clearly. And given the fact that in my experience, a huge chunk of interviews are done by people who don't get very much training, where they, people bring in folks and give them an hour or two of orientation and say, go interview. Uh, well, that's exactly what we did. And they really were not good interviewers, and we could document that. Um, we actually found out that um, going over four or five days of training didn't make the 10 day training was not a success by the measures that we had. And maybe we didn't know how to do it. I'm still not sure that making a super interviewer isn't a good idea. Maybe we didn't have a hard enough task for him to do. But, um, but in any case, we learned that a middle range of, inter of training was probably right. And we thought we had good data, and I'm the, but it was a little less conclusive than some, that, monitor that taping and, and monitoring the, um, the question and answer process uh, made a difference in data quality. One of our problems was the measures of data quality are not easy to come by. Interviewer, one of the interviewer's job is to indiv individualize the, the orientation of the respondent to the question and answer process. One of the things that we emphasize a lot is the importance of interviewers training the respondents to get to the point where they're ready to answer a question. Um, when, when, it, when, when a respondent says, gosh, that seems like a stupid question, you know, or that seems like an awkward question, or the interviewer feels that it's an awkward question, I have no trouble with interviewers saying, you know, this may feel redundant to you because you may have already answered a question that's similar. But let me tell you about the importance of standardization and why it is that if I assume I know what your question is or if I reword it to take into account what you've said, I'm not asking the same question and it'll affect the data. And what I want you to do is to listen to the question the way it's written. It's not that I didn't hear your answer before. It's not that I don't understand that this may even be a little awkwardly worded given what we know. But if you'll answer this question, we'll get the best measurement we can. In fact, you've got to train interviewers really well to be able to, to do that, to be able to listen, to identify what's on the respondent's mind, to tailor the context of the situation to the point where then they, in fact, then you know, are ready to answer the question. Going back to thinking about how did we get people to agree to do telephone interviews, my personal choice was face-to-face -face interviewing. So I found it difficult to convince myself that this would work. The reason was that I knew a person could hang up a phone. And that made me uneasy. I knew in person I would get past that. I could say something, or they'd see me, and I could be convincing. So I had to think about how that could be overcome. And we worked hard on introductions. We made them as short as possible. We always told them the purpose we, I believe in, in telling the truth. And that makes everyone else feel all right, too. And we, we just tested until we found ways to overcome whatever was happening. But in addition, when I called back the refusals, we would now take whatever I had learned and adapt the previous introduction. And interviewers had choices. We didn't lock them into saying precise words. Because in actuality, they don't say our words. We may say them, but they don't. I also would try to incorporate in the training all of our hints for making that job easier. It is difficult. It, it, 
it takes more than my motivating them for them to do it. They really have to be self-starters. And I guess maybe it even started with the availability memo, where we did then and continue to tell interviewers exactly what it's going to be. So they hear about the difficult parts, as well as the monetary or other rewards that there might be. I think one of the most important things to teach an interviewer is how to train the respondent to play the role that they're supposed to play in a standardized interview. Um, and that means that interviewers have to be able to diagnose what the problem is that the respondent's having with the question and answer process and to do what the conversational people talk about is repairs or what we talk about is training. They have to say, I think you're having a problem with this part of the question and answer process. I want to, I want to un if that's not a stupid thing on your part to have a problem with that, but this is a specialized we, uh, measurement process. We have some goals and we have some reasons why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Let me explain what the reasons are and then maybe it'll be easier for you to play the game the way we want you to play it. So training interviewers so that they're good at that, so they identify when respondents need training and then they do a good job of training is one of the very important things to do. And then of course the other thing is that um, there's always a problem of interviewers listening carefully and finding out whether people really are answering the questions that are being asked and doing the probing or repeating of questions, et cetera, that are needed, uh, that's needed in order to, to ha make sure people are really answering the questions that are asked. But I think if, you, if the researcher does not give the interviewer the tools, that is the definitions, the words, et cetera, that they need to, def to really give the respondent the information that they need, that you're really placing an inappropriate burden on the interviewer. Because once the interviewer has to start making up her, his or her own questions, then I think we're all in trouble. Before actually collecting data, every study requires attention to the many details and elements of data production planning, including sample and survey design, developing quality assurance plans, and pretesting, among others. My view of standardization is that every respondent has the same stimulus to which his or her answer is a response. Now, that's what I think standardization is. Now, you can argue that that when someone designs a question that there's heterogeneity in the respondent world and that some words may not mean exactly the same thing to respondent A as they mean to respondent B. Um, that is absolutely a potential problem that, that I accept and we have, we have some data that show that people have different understandings of, of, of the same words. Um, one of the things we've worked with a whole lot is health. Uh, it turns out when you um, ask people um, how would you rate your health and then ask them what did you, were you thinking of when you said health, everybody doesn't have the same idea. So you say, well, is that a standardized question? And I'd say, well, the stimulus is the same, but people interpret it differently. And the challenge for the survey researcher is to write a better question that gets rid of the ambiguity. I mean, that's why one of the reasons why I think the preliminary testing of survey questions with different potential respondents is so important is to identify places where there can be uh, different interpretations of the same question or the same wording and try to clean those up so you can make them more consistent across all people. Will you ever achieve that? There's certainly, are, there's certainly enough diversity out there and there's enough problems with ambiguous words that you probably won't get it perfect. But I would argue that um, while that may be problematic and that there will be some diversity of understanding around that you're sure not going to achieve it by having interviewers make up the questions as they go along. And I think that the notion of having decision rules that will produce comparable measurement across respondents based on, on some kind of, um, of cue that says you use this wording for this kind of respondent and this wording for that kind of respondent is also really troublesome. The most concrete example we have of that is where we try to, to get, translate questions across languages. And, and there you're trying to accomplish the same thing. And it's, as most people who've tried that know, it's extremely difficult to get translations that, that work uh, as identical measures in two different languages. Um, so the notion of having alternative wordings uh, to accomplish the same thing, I think is an implausible argument myself. But it was the techniques that Carl had advocated fitted very well with those 
intensive attitude surveys. And we uh, used them uh, all the way through. Uh, and really, I think they were really quite effective. They, they focused principally on what Carl's notion of client-centered therapy and non-directive therapy, uh, which said your probes are uh, very non-directive. You know, tell me more about this thing. And oh, I'm interested in things of this kind, which uh, stimulated research. And for open questions, they fit beautifully. <laughs> One of the most important things we found, which leads to another theme in my work, is that there was a set of questions that we asked that no matter how much we trained and supervised interviewers, they, there was no way they could ask the questions right. And at that point, it became really clear to me that, um, that the design of questions was one of the limiting factors in, 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 the, in the quality of survey methods, and that we had to learn more about how to design, evaluate questions if we were really going to reduce error in surveys. I put a great deal of importance on pretesting. And I'm uncomfortable asking anybody to do something I'm not willing to do. So I pretested many of the surveys that we administered. And in going out to do the pretest, I learned a lot about what I would need to know if I were going to be the interviewer working on it. I asked field administrators to do the same thing. So in addition to the feedback we got from interviewers at our debriefings, we knew how it felt to be on the other side of that questionnaire. We also would ask respondents at the end of the interview what they thought we meant by particular questions and how they felt when they were asked them. And I would try my best to incorporate that in the training. And when I stood in front of a group of interviewers and I said, I was there, I did this, I know it's difficult, but I also know what you're going to get from doing it right, and right is the only way to do it. I meant it, and I believe they understood that I was sincere. One of the pluses of telephone interviewing from a centralized facility is that it is possible to monitor and supervise what people do um, in a serious, standardized way, and that should be a plus, though I have to say that the documentation that, of the extent to which that's improved the quality of data is not as impressive as the potential would, would see, seem to me to, to lead you to think we could have. The, the other thing that I'm uh, really m involved with is uh, the methodology of interviewing, of uh, probing, of feedback, and so forth. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we give the interviewers an impossible job as we ask them a series of questions and if the respondent says well I don't know what do you I don't know what you mean the interviewer is stuck either he has to say well hell I don't know either <laughs> which is the case <laughs> or he has to give some insipid remark like well you you guess what it is but the fact of the matter is for a lot of the questions we ask it does matter what it is, and you don't want him to use his own judgment. You want to be sure he does what you, you want. Uh, and I think this raises a very serious question in uh, survey methodology. Uh, it, it, we have a pseudo notion of standardization. That's exactly asking the questions. And when it's a simple question, they understood communication is good, but very frequently the respondent can't answer it, doesn't, don't understand it. it. We don't know how to, to tell him. Uh, and it's, now if you're doing an attitude study, you don't want the interviewer explaining anything anymore. Uh, that is, in fact, whatever it means to him, weak as it may be. But if you ask him, uh, have you bought a car recently? And he said, well, I didn't buy a car, but I, I bought a van. The interviewer has got to know, well, now, what do I do now? And it seems to me that the notion of non-direction may not be the appropriate way of standardizing things. Uh, you may say to them, well, hell, tell me, <laughs> no, what was it you bought, really? No, I'll enter that in. So, so there may be some way of handling this. When we did our study of interviewers, uh, I mentioned the fact that one of the things we found was that many of the mistakes that interviewers made, including directive probing, 
uh, not asking questions the way they're written, uh, not get meeting question objectives, could really be attributed specifically to the design of the question rather than to a lack of effort on the part of the interviewer. Often, interviewers use directive probes to solve problems that the researcher created for them. And so th that really led me to say, if you can't design better questions, you can't get better interviewing, and, and led me to get very interested in that. But one of the spin-off issues in there is, well, well what should a, a protocol look like for an interviewer? And, and what's the right way to, to, to make this work? And um, I've been real interested in, uh, you know, again, starting back to my years at Michigan, observing interviewers, seeing what they do, and trying to figure out whether they were doing what we want them to do. And um, possibly um, a lot of people have thought about the issue of what's the right way to conduct an interview in the social science setting. By the time I was at Michigan in the 60s, there were clearly, um, at the University of Michigan, for the most part, people thought you needed to write the questions in order to get consistent data. But it was amazing the extent to which um, we would ask open-ended questions where that wouldn't be the case anymore. Uh, we would ask satisfaction questions in open narrative form and then try to code those. Uh, and <laughs> it was very hard trying to decide whether uh, pretty good was better than not bad. <laughs> uh, it, it, it didn't come naturally. But there was the point there was not so much about question design, but there was still a sense of a more relaxed, n the importance of a more relaxed, interactive flow to an interview. And I think most researchers would have said that an open-ended question and, and um, that, that respondents you know, express themselves and having um, interviewers be able to do a lot of probing was the kind of an interaction that a social science interview ought to, to uh, foster. Um, but, the, but as I say, when you try to figure out how do you get interviewers to, to collect data that you can believe in and that, um, that are in fact can be added up and produce the kind of statistics you want to produce, um, I keep getting back to the fact that in the end you've got to ask interviewers to ask questions consistently across all respondents or you can't know uh, what the answers are and it's hard to use the data. Now, let me just talk about that a little more. At the, at the very least, Schumann and Presser and a whole bunch of other people have, there is a huge amount of documentation that for asking questions about subjective states, small changes in question wording produce big changes in distribution. Um, well, if I send an interviewer out and say, find out how people feel about having communists speak in public, whether they ask, you think it's all right to allow them to speak in public, or do you think we should forbid them to speak in public, you get really different answers. We, we know that, and, and we know that that small changes in all kinds of subjective wording, worded qu subjectively, questions about subject, we know that small changes in questions about subjective states produce big effects on the answers that are, occur. I don't see how anyone can argue that you can measure subjective states without standardization, which means that each interviewer has got to, in the end, ask questions in a very precise way. I also have trouble thinking about how you can get factual data if, if if interviewers do not ask, can at least convey consistent definitions and understanding of what it is people are supposed to report about. Um, I've written papers that note that if you, whether you tell people that walking counts or does not count as exercise affects the percentage of people who say they exercised. Well, I can't go have an interviewer say, go ask them about exercise and, and not tell them whether they're supposed to specify walking or not, because I know it can have 10, 20 percent point percentage points difference in the rates at which people say they'll exercise. Whether they say, they, when they ask people, how often did you eat butter last week, if they don't say, I'm not including margarine, or I am including margarine, you get a huge difference. So I can't have interviewers going out, and some of them including margarine and some not including margarine, and expect to have data that are consistent. Now, so as you know, there have been critics who've said, well, um, you, you can't, standardization is is overly structured. It's not a natural way to interact. Um, it, it creates a, 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 a negative interview situation that, that affects adversely respondent participation in, in, in the process. And um, the examples that they trot out are, are awful, usually. But in my view, what they usually are is examples of awful questions. 
that, 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 that if you write the protocols right, you can set it up so that interviewers actually ask the question you need to have them ask if you'll give them a question that they can read the way that, that you designed it. So the problem is, how do you do that? It's a script problem, I think, rather than a standardization issue. Now, there's a lot of pieces in here. It's, it's perfect. Interviewer, one of the interviewer's job is to individualize the, the orientation of the respondent to the question and answer process. When the question and answer process occurs, I think the researcher's got to write a, a question with wording that an interviewer can read and that then will prepare a respondent to answer. There are some awkward interactions in interviews that stem in particular from getting responses to questions that have complex definitions. I think that's the, the situation that, that's the hardest. Uh, there was a nice example in a paper um, given uh, by some folks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they were trying to ask people about how, how, what their houses were like. And they asked you know, how many baths people had and um, how, what to count as a room and what not to count as a room and, um, and that sort of thing. And, and I think working on protocols for getting that kind of information we're making sure people have definitions. Reading long paragraphs of definitions is not a good solution to, a, to an interview script. And, and I think we need to get beyond that. And I don't think, I'm really excited about the work that's being done to see if we can't get beyond that. The key thing is you've got to get people to have shared definitions in some way so they're answering the same question. Now, whether there are triggers and ways that we can work it out so that um, the people that need the additional or the detailed information can be given it but you don't have to read it to everybody. I think that there's some promise there. Uh, it's obviously a completely stupid question to say, do um, you have any half baths? And somebody says, what's a half bath? And you say, well, whatever it means to you. I mean, that's just dumb survey design. That's uh, a factual question. People have to have a shared definition of what it is, if it's going to be meaningful. And you've got, to you've got to make sure that there's a process in place to get people so they're all answering the same question. So for example, you could say how many bathrooms are there and how many of those have uh, tubs or showers and how many of them don't. That actually will pretty well take care of it. Um, one of the problems um, with, the, with the half bath question, which can often be solved another way, is that it, it was aimed at getting everyone to have a shared definition before answering the question. One of the solutions to a lot of those questions is actually to ask people questions that they can answer without getting them to have the shared definition that's in the researcher's head. So for example, I can ask people if anyone took anything from them and whether they were present when they was taken from them and whether the person threatened them in any way when they took the thing from them. Now when I have the answers to those questions, I know whether they're the victim of a robbery, which is taking something from someone by force or threat of force. And I don't have to, to teach every respondent that definition in order to get the information uh, to have a standardized information from all respondents about whether they were or were not victims of robbery. There are a lot of th problems that can be solved that way. So um, I am quite aware that there are some awkward interactions that go on in, in survey interviews. Um, there, it, there are several ways to attack the problem of how to make the interaction go smoothly so that interviewers don't look stupid and at the same time the respondents, in fact, are answering the same questions and questions that they're able to answer. Well, so I think there are ways in which you could design the questionnaire and train the interviewers to get around some of these problems, but I don't know quite how you do it. I had hoped that when you got to Cappy, or Caddy, even, that you could immediately go to a screen and if a respondent says, what do you mean by, you could get to another screen that would say, here's what we mean by, and then you could say to them, and you don't need to worry about exact wording. What we mean is the following. Uh, but somehow or other, there seems to be a lot of technical problems with that. Clearly, one of, the, one of the areas in which I'm spending the most time recently is how to uh, design and evaluate survey questions. Not that everybody doesn't think that they do that all the time, but, um, but I've really thought hard about how to sort of how to think about questions and what the standards ought to be for questions. One of the things that I've learned uh, that I didn't used to know is um, that I now think about survey questions. 
I have a concept called total question design, which is the moral equivalent of total survey design. And one of the problems with survey questions, one of the reasons that smart people write bad questions, is they tend to sum standards for questions and not others. If you'd had those four sets of standards, um, um, whether the, you're, you're asking the right questions, basically, whether they're worded, whether they work cognitively, whether they work as a script for an interview, and, and whether they meet psychometric standards, those are at least four sets of, of think criteria that you'd hold up. And they don't always lead to the same question. Um, they often lead to different questions or in different directions. Um, two response categories, yes or no, is, is a, works better from an interaction point of view. It's, it's easier for people to answer. Uh, it's easier to figure out the answer, usually. So often for cognitive and, um, and for uh, standardization purposes, uh, Two, two option questions are, are best, whereas for psychometric purposes, you don't get nearly as much information as more complex questions provide. And there are lots of examples where um, provide a great example is that from a cognitive point of view, I may desperately want to provide a complex definition to every single respondent, but it may make for a stupid protocol between uh, an interviewer and respondent. And so that may not be the best way to solve that problem, or there may be a tension to figure out how to both make sure everybody understands things in the same way and we've got a script and an interview interaction that you can live with. So the, the understanding that one of the tensions in, in designing questions is that there are lots of different standards that people hold up. And in order to find out if they meet these standards, uh, you've got to do different things. And then you've got to make trade-offs or figure out ways to address all the issues simultaneously in some kind of an optimal way. Um, that, that's why designing questions is so hard, I think why we why there are a lot of bad questions out there that we need to make better.